kind of year, hasn't it? Who here's gotten enough rest this year? <laughs> so, yeah, aren't, aren't we glad though that our God is in control? So this is the last uh, last Sunday of the year, and and uh, another week from now we'll be able to say hindsight is 2020, and that's going to have a whole new meaning, right? So it's been an interesting year. Amen. So uh, last, the last time we, we read through Hebrews chapter 6, 7, and 8, and, and we saw that uh, in, in Hebrews um, 7, uh, I'm sorry, in Hebrews chapter 6, that by two immutable things, we can have hope in God's promises in the new covenant, in uh, that he swore and he, he also he took an oath. Okay, in the Old Testament, in, in Psalms 110. And that, that oath, that what he promised, was that Jesus Christ would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, the, the king of peace, which is a superior priesthood, an eternal one, an eternal priesthood. We also saw that we have a high priest who sits next to God the Father, a minister to the heavenly sanctuary in the true tabernacle in heaven. Now we're going to, this week, uh, this, this message, we're going to go ahead and look at that heavenly tabernacle. We're going to look at the worldly tabernacle and the heavenly, which is a shadow, a, a representation of the one in the heavens. Okay. So first, uh, starting off in uh, 1 through 3 here, it says, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is ne of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. So every high priest, you know, they, they have a specific role once a year to, to offer, uh, well, the, uh, the high priests, of course, all have to offer gifts and sacrifices at the temple, but once a year there's a special sacrifice that the high priest offers for the sins of the people. And so what, what is it that Jesus had to offer? What did he offer? He offered himself. He offered his own blood, right? That's what he brought before God. We see in, in verse number four, for if he were on earth, he should not, have, should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. So Jesus is not of an earthly priesthood. We saw that. He's not of the Levitical priesthood. That's a temporary priesthood in order to sanctify fleshly things. But he's a, of an eternal priesthood in order to sanctify spiritual things. Okay? Well, what needs to be sanctified? We'll get to that in a bit. We see in uh, verse 5, um, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for sea saith he that thou makest all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So what's important about that? Why would God specify exactly to, to Moses how things should be, how long it should be, how wide it should be, all of the details of this tabernacle? Why would God do that? Why would God want to, why not just let Moses decide? Why would God want to tell Moses, what would God have known that Moses would not have known? Yes, because God has access to the heavenly tabernacle and he knows exactly what it should look like. Exactly what it should, because it's, it's a shadow of the heavenly tabernacle since it's representing that heavenly tabernacle. So this earthly tabernacle is just a temporary thing to, to help us see 
what that heavenly tabernacle is all about. But now, so verse number six, but now hath he, that's Jesus Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. So that, that word there, ministry, is diaphoros, okay? And uh, right after that it says, um, sorry, hold on. Sorry, the more excellent is diaphoros and then ministry is liturgia. Sorry, I, I said that wrong. Liturgia. Liturgia. There we go. Got to pronounce, emphasize the I there. Uh, and it's where we get the word liturgy from. It's where we get the word liturgy passed through the Greek. So Jesus Christ is the high priest that is the one who, who um, took, took place, uh, who did the ministry in that heavenly tabernacle. And as we saw, that ministry only needed to take place one time, the, the, of offering the blood sacrifice. It only had to take place one time, okay? He doesn't have to go and, and offer that sacrifice ever again. So it, it happened once. It doesn't need to happen again. But there, there are other things of the ministry in the tabernacle that take place. And we're going to see that in the next chapter here. But before we get there, um, verse number seven, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So the first covenant, it wasn't complete in that it could not, it could not sanctify our conscience, it could not sanctify our hearts and our minds. It could sanctify fleshly things. It could sanctify the the physical, temporal things for the service of God, but it could not sanctify our souls, right? For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. So this is where he's quoting from. We're going to do something. We're going to actually read all the way to the end of the chapter. So we're not just going to read what he quoted, but we're going to also put it into context by reading what came after it, okay? Because I think it, it's, it's quite interesting what, what comes after it, too. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. This is verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, 
For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So that's where the Hebrews part finished. But I want to go on and I want to read to the end of the chapter. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched beneath, I will cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel unto the gate of the corner, and the measuring line shall yet go forth over against it upon the hill Garib, and shall compass about to Goeth, and the whole valley of the dead bodies, and of the ashes, and the, all the fields unto the brook of Kidron, unto the corner of the horse gate toward the east, shall be holy unto the Lord. It shall not be plucked up, nor thrown down any more forever. So how appropriate that in the book of Jeremiah, after this, this part where we looked at that was in Hebrews, that he talks about a new city, a new Jerusalem that will come. Okay, So there's more to that promise. And the, the Hebrews knew that. The Hebrews knew that. When the author of Hebrews wrote that to them, he knew that there was a promise of a new Jerusalem that came in the passages. That they knew that there was a promise there. Okay, but I want you guys to know that. I want, I want to bring this into full perspective. Okay. What we see is the point here, though, in, in verse 31 through 34, we see that in the Old Covenant, well, uh, well, let's do some contrast, okay? In the Old Covenant, there was a hierarchy, right? So if you wanted to worship, you wanted to get to God, there was a hierarchy that you needed to go through. There was the high priest. There were below the, below the high priest, there were the priests. Okay? If you want to bring your offering, you bring it to the priests. There were the Jews below the priests. And then there was everyone else, the Gentiles, right? So there was this hierarchy in the Old Covenant. But in the New Covenant, let's see what he says here. He says, in verse... Um, It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Again, continuing down here, um, it says that, And they shall teach, verse 34, And they shall teach uh, no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Before that it says, um, After those days saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and, I, and will be their God and they shall be my people. So he'll be their God and they will be his people. There's no more hierarchy there. There's God and there's us. We have direct access through Jesus Christ to God. There's no going through the Jerusalem, there's no going through Israel to access God. We can access God directly. Also in the Old Covenant, Jews were a light to the surrounding darkness of the other nations. Right? But in the New Covenant, both Jews and Gentiles can know God. And a church can be anywhere. God's people can be anywhere. Even in Cambodia. 
not just in Jerusalem. So that, that's another part that's been fulfilled about this prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 31. And how the church, as the new covenant of the church, fulfills that prophecy. Also in the old covenant, the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And the law was written in tablets, kept in the Ark of the Covenant, which was kept in the temple at Jerusalem. But in the new covenant, God writes his law on our minds and our hearts. As we heard this morning, it's not about following these precepts and various things because since we have been cleansed by Jesus' blood and we have the Holy Spirit dwelling among us, God can guide us in what we should and shouldn't do. It's not about following a bunch of thou shalt and then thou shalt not, but it's about doing what is expedient. It's about liberty within what is expedient, as Pastor spoke about this morning. And so again, the aspects of Jeremiah chapter 31 have been fill, fulfilled in the New Covenant, in the New Testament church. And Hebrews really highlights that because, you know, when I look at Jeremiah chapter 31, if I didn't have the book of Hebrews, I would almost wonder if that had yet been fulfilled. Okay? But by reading the book of Hebrews, I see that, yes, it has been fulfilled. Yes. Within the New Testament church, both Jew and Gentile can come to the Lord. And so, yeah, those passages, let's just read through that one more time in just chapter 8, verses um, 8 through 12. Sorry, verses, yeah, verses 8 through 12. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Okay, and then in verse 13 it says, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And we know at that time, at that time this was written, the temple was still at Jerusalem. Okay? But in a while, Within a couple of years, a couple decades, that temple would be flattened, destroyed completely. Okay? The temple would be destroyed by the Roman uh, Empire. Going on to, well, let's, let's talk about something. Um, so the old covenant was ready to vanish away. I, I don't want to minimize the place of Israel and the place of um, Judah, of how significant the people of God were to him. Okay, I don't want to minimize that. And I want to actually just, maybe we can take a moment to just focus on how they fit in to the picture here. Because, okay, many years ago, many years ago, um, well, let, me just, let me just say that, that Israel is very important to to God. They have a special place, a very special place to God, okay? And that's why you see in that, that prophecy, it was focused on Israel, 
It was focused on the Jews. Okay. Um, many years ago, a, a friend of mine who, um, kind of an amateur director, movie director, had asked me and some friends to, to um, be in a film that he was doing. It was a Christian type of film, action Christian film, but just, you know, amateur within the city there, a local film. And, uh, you know, sometimes you would, you would stay up really, really late to just do one scene. Like one time we all were supposed to meet there. Okay, we're supposed to meet at 8 o'clock. Be ready. Okay? And then, uh, oh, the blood doesn't look right. It doesn't look real enough. So someone has to run to the store and we have to concoct some, you know, fake blood that looks better for the, 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 the camera. Okay, so then 3 a.m. rolls around and we finally get to, to rolling the camera and, and doing the film. And so there were several nights like that, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of work, but, you know, it was just for, for fun. Um, but then you get to, you, you guys know what a movie premiere is? A movie premiere is when the people who took part, place in helping to create this film sit down and watch the movie. It's the first showing of the movie. Okay? And we kind of see a similar situation with when, when Jesus Christ came in, in Israel. They, they had been instrumental in one being the line through which Christ would come, two preparing the the people and the law, um, having Jerusalem, having the temple ready, all of these things in place for Jesus. Okay, so when Jesus came, Israel had a very special place in that. In fact, let's go to Matthew chapter ten, verse five through six. When uh, Jesus was sending out the 12 disciples, he says this, These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any, of the, any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we see that when through, throughout Jesus' ministry, his focus was on Israel. They had first dibs. You guys know what first dibs are? When uh, my, my, I have four brothers and a younger sister, and you know when we, uh, we fight over who would have first dibs, you know, mom brings home the groceries, and you know, we have the cereal or some other snack that you know, everyone wants. And then whoever gets first dibs, you know, maybe we have rock, paper, scissors. So who's going to have first dibs? Who's the first one that gets to taste it, right? And so Israel had first dibs to the new covenant. They had first dibs to Jesus Christ. And then let's look again in Matthew chapter 15. Verses 22 through 24. Now here we see Jesus, he's um, at the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Okay? And so this is near Canaan. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him. Now, Canaan is not part of Israel, okay? And cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So we see here that, that Jesus came to deliver the new covenant to Israel. And then later, the new covenant, Israel would bring it out to the Gentiles. 
to everyone else. So they had first right to that new covenant. It says that in uh, Romans that we were grafted in, we were grafted in to that new covenant as Gentiles. Yet, I want to also point out that in this passage, Jesus still moved with compassion to help this young, this mother. It's in verse 25, it says, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And that, that word there for dogs is like puppies, like the small puppies that are under the table. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. You know, what I see here when I read this, it's like Jesus took his heavenly checkbook out from his pocket. He signed a check. He didn't write in the amount. He just said, here, whatever you want, whatever you need, you fill it in. Of course, she wanted her daughter healed, but Jesus was so impressed by her faith that he just said, okay, whatever you need. Hebrews chapter 9. So then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary for there was a tabernacle, uh, there was a tabernacle made the first, sorry, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And so we have this first part, now the, the in the temple, on the north side of the temple, is where the tabernacle is located. And so when you go into the first room, which is only allowed for the priests, okay, the Jews cannot go in unless they are ordained as a priest and from the line of Levi. So when the priests go in, you have on the one side, you've got um, the, the candlestick, the menorah, and that's, that actually represents the churches. Represents the churches. And then you have, on the other side, you've got the table with the showbread. These uh, unleavened bread. You've got 12 of them. Six on each plate. And they're sprinkled on those frankincense. And these were an offering to the Lord. They could only be eaten by the priests. Well, what they would do is, you know, they bring in the showbread that people would give, and then they would leave it there until the next Sabbath. And then the priests would eat the old showbread, and then new showbread was placed. So it actually sat there for a while. But what it shows is God's provision for his people. Also, Jesus said something very interesting in John 6, verse 35. Let's go there. Let's go to verse 34, actually. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So, Jesus is our supply. Jesus is our provision. He is the bread of life. Then when you get um, through that first room, you come to a, a big curtain, a real thick curtain. I mean, it's a very thick curtain that, you know, you can't really quite see through or go through unless you intend to go through it. 
And uh, let's continue on to verse, in Hebrews, um, verse 3. Hebrews 9. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budeth, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So you come in and, and then inside of there, there is the uh, Ark of the Covenant in the Holiest of Holies. And inside of that you have the, the golden censer, okay, and then you also have the, um, the sorry, in, inside there's the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant there's a golden pot with the manna, some of the manna that came from heaven while they're in the wilderness and Aaron's rod, and then the two tablets of the law, and then you've got the cherubims over the mercy seat on top of the covenant, okay, that sit over the law, representing how Jesus, how Jesus, uh, who would sit in that mercy seat, would become, uh, cover the law for us, okay? His blood would cover the law for us because they would place the blood of the sacrifices on that covenant, okay? Now, I'm going to say that we're just, we're barely scratching the surface in all of the, the issues about the tabernacle. And I, ensure, I encourage you to, to research it and, and go back through the Old Testament. Um, you can read about these, these things um, and what they represent. Uh, to get a better understanding about them. I am a Gentile, and my knowledge is limited on these things inside of the tabernacle. But, um, so we're just going to cover only a limited part of this, but there's a lot more. Let me just say there's a lot more to uncover. And I'm sure um, when we get to heaven, we can also ask God to explain it to us even better than I would ever be able to. So, yeah, I'm sure... Jesus would be very happy to tell us more about it. So moving on to verse number six. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, or well, as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings, and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So the, the priests would enter into the area with the candlestick and the table of showbread often, but going into the holiest of holies was done only once a year by the high priest. Amen? And while the tabernacle was still standing, and while that curtain was still blocking the way to the holiest of holies. It signified that the way had not yet been made in that heavenly tabernacle. But can anyone tell me what happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross? What happened inside of the temple? Yes, the curtain in front of the holiest of holies split in two. Okay, and this was a very thick curtain. It wasn't, it wasn't thin like my shirt here. This was a very thick curtain, and it split in two. 
I mean, it would take a lot of strength to split uh, this particular curtain. And when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain split, showing that his death and sacrifice provided a way for us to enter in that most sacred part of the heavenly tabernacle. So now we can have access to that heavenly tabernacle, into the holiest of holies. We can have a direct access to God. Verse 11, it says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats, and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through this the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So we see here something. Did the Old Testament sacrifices serve a purpose? What purpose did they serve? I'm sorry? Well, the, the, the Old Testament, this is, we'll, we'll talk about like the, the sacrifices so the, in the law. They performed the sacrifices each year. Um, what purpose did those sacrifices serve? Yeah, so, one, so there's one thing is that they foreshadow. Yeah, for cleansing. But I want to be specific here. For cleansing fleshly things for cleansing things that are temporal so they did serve a purpose we live in the flesh and at the time what the, the priests they had to go through all of these rituals to cleanse themselves for the service of God so they served a purpose in their them being able to use their flesh to serve God had to be cleansed in this manner with fleshly things but because flesh is temporal, because flesh is temporary, these things, these sacrifices, could not cleanse the spirit. They could not cleanse the conscience. They could not cleanse the hearts and minds of the people. But Jesus' blood is eternal. Jesus' blood can cleanse our conscience, can cleanse our hearts and our minds. So the focus here is on the eternal. So if it says, let me just read that again. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. So it did serve that purpose. It sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So Hebrews, you're thinking about going back to the old covenant worship. You're thinking about leaving out of, of the church. You're thinking about going away from, from what Jesus had given you. Okay? But Jesus, when he died on the cross, his blood cleansed your conscience. You don't need to go back to doing those, those old sacrifices anymore. Your conscience is cleansed. You can now serve him in the new covenant. So to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. 
So we still see that the focus here is about the new covenant and about how through the new covenant we can receive the promise of eternal inheritance. We're talking about inheritance here. Inheritance. Um, this is not, these, these verses and these passages are not specifically talking about salvation to, from dead works. Okay, it's not specifically talking about salvation or when we got saved, okay? Because people in the Old Testament, they also were saved. Okay, people who, who had repented, turned to God and put their trust on the coming Messiah and the sacrifice that he would give for all, were saved just like we are, okay? By repentance and faith. But what we're talking about here is about the new covenant and promises of eternal inheritance. That's the focus here. And so that's why, you know, we have to be careful when we're reading these verses that we don't lose sight of that focus of what's being talked about. Because otherwise, when we go and we read some of these verses and we just try to apply it to salvation, we'll come away with the idea that you can lose your salvation, that you can lose eternal life. But that's not what it's saying. That's not the focus here. So we want to keep it in focus. So moving on to verse 16 through 17. For where a testament is, and by the way, the, the word in the Greek for testament and for covenant, they're the same word. Okay? So let me see this word. Um, it's tarafeke, and it's the exact same word for covenant or testament, okay? And what is a testament? Let's go ahead and read 16 and 17. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force. After men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So can anyone tell me what a testament is? It's a will, yeah. So you have some things and you, uh, you know you're going to die, so you write a will and you say, okay, I'm going to make sure you know, the pastor gets this, my brother gets this, my wife gets this, my, my son and daughters, they get this, okay? Right? You write a will. So when you pass away, people know what to do with your stuff. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here is a will. When we were saying a testament, we're talking about inheritance after someone's death. So for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. You know, when at that time, a lot of the Hebrews, a lot of the Jews believe that when the Messiah comes, he's going to come and he's going to conquer. He's going to overthrow the Roman government. And he's going to rule and he's going to reign right away. Okay? They were not absolutely fond of a Messiah coming who would be crucified. This was not what they had in mind. Okay? So Jesus didn't come and and conquer and rule and reign. So it wasn't exactly meeting their initial expectations based on the prophecies that they had read. Okay? Now the prophecies were there. They talk about in Isaiah 53, for example, how Jesus would be a lamb brought before the slaughter. The prophecies were there. They just chose not to focus on those prophecies because, you know, that didn't exactly uh, make their position you know, much better. So, uh, being, being people and in and, and the way we are, you know, we, we definitely uh, look short-sighted. And so that's what they were looking at, is they wanted Jesus Christ to come and rule and reign. But he says here, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after the men are dead. So when someone dies, then their will goes in force. Before they're dead, the will is not in force. 
Otherwise, it is of no strength at all, while the testator liveth. Verse 18, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. So the first testament was also dedicated with blood. Okay? For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into the heavens itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enter into the holy place every year with blood of others. But then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so it says here, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So I just want to focus on that for a moment. And as it is appointed unto men, once to die, but after this the judgment. So, how did that happen? Where, okay, so where did the death come in? Where did that come from? Why is it appointed unto men once to die? What happened? Sin, okay. But let's go back. Let's go back to the garden. Let's go back to the garden. What happened in the garden? God said, in the day you eat of the fruit, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, in that day ye shall die. And spiritually, when Adam ate of that fruit, of the, tr the tree of knowledge, when Adam and Eve ate of that, they spiritually died. Okay? They spiritually died. And we all inherited from that death. We all inherited from that. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. So it said earlier about, you know, that when there is the death of the testator, I was thinking about that, you know, and now I know he focuses on the Old Testament, but I was even thinking about that to just how it applies to what happened in the garden. You know, as uh, not to say that, you know, it doesn't apply to the, the Old Testament and to the sacrifices that were given, but, you know, we inherited the law of sin. We inherited the law of our conscience of guilt from Adam when he died in the garden, when he spiritually died in the garden, then we inherited all of that. But through Jesus Christ, we can inherit something, e eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, we can inherit eternal inheritance, right? So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, un and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So I just thought it was an interesting contrast there, you know, between what Adam gave us and what Jesus Christ gave us, right? Where Adam gave us the knowledge of sin, Jesus Christ gave us eternal life, gave us a pure conscience. So, 
And then, of course, you know, because of what Adam did, the law had to come. The law came to point to us, to show us that we needed a Savior, right? You know, I would like to, we've still got a little bit more time, and I would like to just delve into chapter uh, 10 for a little bit. Um, so in, in moving on to verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. So we get that same idea that, that these offerings that were given year after year after year, they only purified the flesh, they only sanctified the flesh, but they did not affect the spirit. They had no effect to the spirit. So because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. So Jesus came for us. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst thou had its pleasure in the, therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes, the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. So here we're going back to Jeremiah chapter 31. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. So now we come to the whole summary of what we're getting at. What, what is the author of Hebrews wanting to tell them to do? Now we get to the, the, the real essence here in verse 22. Because a lot of this has been kind of repetitive. We get the point. Jesus died once for all. Okay, we got that. Let's, let's move on now and see what was the point of saying all that. Why did he build up to all of this? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, 
but exhorting one another and so much more as ye see the day approaching. We can see that there were some Hebrews that left out. There were some Hebrews that, he says, as the manner of some is, who left out completely from the New Covenant and went back to the Old Testament worship. Okay. And he's saying to those who are remaining, what you are in is so much better. It's the true. It's not just a shadow. You're in the true worship now. This was the covenant we were, the, the old covenant was pointing to. This was the covenant that we were looking forward to, that Jeremiah prophesied about. Don't leave out. Don't leave out. So he really focuses on the importance of this, this new covenant. And that, that word forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, that, that word there is enkataliapo, which means to completely leave behind and not come back. It's not talking about just, sometimes we use this passage in like, okay, let's make sure, you know, we're meeting several times a week. This particular word is talking about just leaving out entirely. It means like completely, not, not meeting together anymore. Okay, that's what this, this word here means. Forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another, okay, lifting each other up. So here we can see the whole emphasis without ever saying in this passage, he doesn't say the word church, but he says church. It's all over it. You know, that we're to love one another, we're to exhort one another, that it's all about looking out for the brethren. And we can see that here. So much more as you see the day approaching. And now he, he goes into verse 26 and he says, For if we sin, that is, if we, if we uh, hamartano, okay, to miss the mark, if we miss the mark, willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So the idea here is not that this person is going to face all this judgment and condemnation, but oh, they certainly would deserve it. You know, if after you know how important the church is, how important what Jesus Christ did for us was and you still leave out you well you wouldn't receive that punishment it doesn't say that you receive that punishment the wording here is clear that the person isn't going to receive that punishment but of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy to be deemed entitled okay to be you know like he really should have had something bad happen to them after, you know, after they just left out knowing how good this was. Okay, so, so really, you know, it's kind of a shameful thing. It's really a shameful thing. You know, someone leaves out from, from God's new covenant. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So th there is a matter of, you know, the, when someone leaves out of the church, they will be under the judgment of God. God will chase after them. God will go after them. But call into remembrance the former days 
in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. So, you know, they faced a lot of persecution. And through that persecution, a lot of them had left. Some of them had left. So he's acknowledging, the author here is acknowledging the, the persecution that they've endured. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing, that, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that, he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. So now we're in this, this time period that, you know, it seems like, well, it's been 2,000 years. It seems like it's been a long time, right? But actually, in the scheme of eternity, this is just a, a small vapor of time. You see, Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. And when he comes back, at that time, we'll realize just how small and insignificant this particular time is. Okay, after, you know, the first, let's say, million years, billion years, trillion years, and we're going to look back and we're going to say, well, that was nothing. That was nothing. Okay, so while we wait for, to receive the promise, in fact, each and every one of us, you know, we don't, we don't live all that long to begin with. So when we go to sleep, we'll be with the Lord anyway. So it's not that we have to wait a very long time to begin with. For ye have need of patience. After that, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he, sh he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Okay, and then that word there, is actually a, a different word than um, the, the word that we looked at for salvation before. The, this word is peripoiesis, and it, it means preservation, okay? Preservation. And then, of course, soul is suke, which is the same that is used for soul. It means to, it's a breath, the idea of a breath that God breathed into us is where that comes from. Okay, so main point here, though, is that we, with all of these things we were learning in Hebrews, now we're not done yet, but with all these things we were learning in Hebrews, the whole focal point is just the importance of us coming together, of us valuing the new covenant, importance of us um, exhorting each other, of walking by faith and of loving each other. This is, this is what the focus here is. Okay. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. Brother Wilson, you want to?